Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore, and welcome to this edition of The Bennis Report with Phyllis Bennis, who now joins us from Washington, D.C. Phyllis is a fellow and the director of the New Internationalism Project at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington. She's the author of the books Before and After, U.S. Foreign Policy and the War on Terrorism, and Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, a primer. Thanks for joining us again, Phyllis. Great to be with you, Paul. So Stephen Hawking's announced he will not attend a conference in Israel. What, what, what's that about and how significant is that? This is an extraordinary move on his part. This is probably the highest profile participant in the longstanding uh, academic and cultural boycott that's part of the global movement for what is known as BDS, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, a Palestinian civil society call that came out in 2005 urging people to bring nonviolent economic and social and cultural pressure to bear on Israel until it stops its violations of international law and human rights. For someone of Stephen Hawking's stature to make a decision like this and be very clear that this was not because of ill health, uh, it was specifically because of, as he put it in a statement, what he knows about Palestine and the recommendations that he sought from his Palestinian academic colleagues this is huge. This uh, was not really an academic Phyllis, conference. Phyllis, just, just one sec. I'll just jump in with a quote from The Guardian, which I've just seen, mm. where uh, this apparently is a, an article that was written about this and approved by Hawking. Uh, right. This is what he said. His, it describes the cancellation as, quote, his independent decision to respect the boycott based upon his knowledge of Palestine and on the unanimous advice of his own academic context there. It's an amazing thing to not only decide not to participate, and again, this was not an academic conference per se, this was a thoroughly political conference. It's the annual uh, president's conference that they hold in Israel every year under the auspices of now Israeli president Shimon Peres, uh, and he was to be the keynote speaker. It always brings together global famous people of all different kinds, cultural workers, scientists, writers, artists, etc. And for someone of Hawking's stature to make this decision and make that statement that he's doing it independently in respect of the boycott. That's huge. This is going to be a huge move forward for the boycott movement overall. And I think it's going to move very close to making Israeli uh, people, ordinary people, uh, recognize the cost that their occupation and their apartheid policies are having on them. It's not only something that happens to the government. You know, this is very similar, Paul, to the, uh, the period in the, in the late 80s, uh, the, uh, sorry, the late 70s and throughout the 1980s of the South Africa anti-apartheid movement at the time when boycotts and divestment campaigns were underway, much of them focused on, on the banks and the corporations. But it was the sports boycott that really engaged white South Africans because sports, and particularly South Africa's role in the international sporting world, uh, was hugely important for ordinary South Africans. Well, this is, this is what I was going to ask you. Uh, th there's, there's been some critique from especially, you can say left of center, liberal um, Israeli academics who, who themselves have been very critical of the occupation, but they've critiqued the cultural part of the boycott. They agree with the, the sort of commercial boycott, but they say by the cultural boycott and, and especially boycotting universities, it isolates many of the academics in Israel who are in fact critical of the policy. What, what do you make of that? That's true. As far as it goes, that's a true statement. It does isolate to some degree those uh, uh, individual academics. The boycott is very clear. The boycott call is not aimed at individual academics. It doesn't call for no one to talk to Palestinian academics, for example, or Pal uh, sorry, it does not call for no one to talk to Israeli academics or Israeli scientists. The boycott aims at institutions, uh, Israeli government and, and academic institutions. But there is no question that the, the pain of the boycott will be felt by individual Israelis. And the theory is, and this is again, where it comes very close to the models that we saw during the South African era anti-apartheid movement, when South African, ordinary South African whites were affected by the, the sports boycott, they began to finally reconsider the cost to them of apartheid. In the Israeli instance, it means that Israelis who see Israeli culture and science and technology, the great accomplishments of, of Israeli society and what they're most proud of, perhaps, in their society, that when that starts to be affected 
by this global boycott, when you have instances of people like Stephen Hawking saying, I will not participate in an official institutional Israeli conflict because there is a boycott designed to force Israel to stop its violations of international law and human rights. That's, yeah, that's give, a give, huge give, reality. Given how seriously Israel takes its science and scientists, the, fact that, the fact that Hawking, and for I, I assume most people know, but I think we should mention for those who don't, uh, Hawking is one of the world's leading physicists and cosmologists. Uh, he's and a, he's a serious, a serious brain. Scientist, probably the most famous scientist of any scientist in the world today who's alive today. He's an extraordinary genius of a man. And the, the stature of that kind of a decision makes this inordinately important. And I think it very much parallels how white South Africans felt about the sports boycott. It was like the end of their world as they knew it. When that starts to happen with ordinary Israelis, when they start to realize that they are paying a price for these Israeli policies, they will begin to demand a change. All right, thanks for joining us, Phyllis. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.